Welcome! Welcome to the History Obscura Reading Room. I am your host, Mandy Gardner. I do hope you have a hot cup of tea ready, and perhaps a nice tray of sweets. That's the way to do tea properly, you know. Tonight's story is a special one, and it comes not from my lips, but from those of Vasco da Gama. Well, not literally. I'm quite sure da Gama no longer has any lips. Nevertheless, the journal of his first voyage around Africa is where our story comes from tonight. Once upon a time, we left Restello on Saturday, July 8th, 1497. May God, our Lord, permit us to accomplish this voyage in his service. Amen. On the following Saturday, we sighted the Canaries, and in the night passed to the lee of Lancarote. During the following night, at break of day, we made the Terra Alta, where we fished for a couple of hours, and in the evening, at dusk, we were off to the Rio do Oro, the River of Gold. The fog during the night grew so dense that Paolo da Gama lost sight of the Captain Major, and when day broke we saw neither him nor the other vessels. We therefore made sail for the Cape Verde Islands, as we had been instructed to do in case of becoming separated. On the following Saturday, at break of day, we sighted the Ilha do Sal, and in an hour afterwards discovered three vessels, which turned out to be the store ship, and the vessels commanded by Nicolo Coelho and Bartholomew Diaz, the last of whom sailed in our company as far as the mine. They too had lost sight of the Captain Major. Having joined company, we pursued our route, but the wind fell and we were becalmed until Wednesday. At ten o'clock on that day, we sighted the Captain Major about five leagues ahead of us, and having got speech with him in the evening, we gave expression to our joy by many times firing off our bombards and sounding the trumpets. The day after this, a Thursday, we arrived at the island of Santiago and joyfully anchored in the bay of Santa Maria, where we took on board meat, water, and wood and did the much-needed repairs to our yards. On the 22nd of the same month, when going south by west, we saw many birds resembling herons. On the approach of night, they flew vigorously to the south-southeast, as if making for land. On the same day, being then quite 800 leagues out at sea, we saw a whale. On Friday, October 7th, the eve of St. Simon and Jude, we saw many whales, as also quokas and seals. On Saturday, at 9 o'clock, we sighted the land. We then drew near to each other, and having put on our gala clothes, saluted the Captain Major by firing our bombards, and dressed the ships with flags and standards. The bay was found to be very clean, and to afford shelter against all winds except those from the northwest, and we named it Santa Helena. The inhabitants of this country are tawny-colored. Their food is confined to the flesh of seals, whales, and gazelles, and the roots of herbs. They are dressed in skins and wear sheaths over the virile members. They are armed with poles of olive wood to which a horn, browned in the fire, is attached. Their numerous dogs resemble those of Portugal and bark like them. The birds of the country, likewise, are the same as in Portugal and include cormorants, gulls, turtle doves, crested larks, and many others. The climate is healthy and temperate and produced good herbage. On the day after we had cast anchor, that is on Thursday, we landed with the Captain Major and made captive one of the natives, who was small of stature like Sancho Mechia. This man had been gathering honey in the sandy waste, for in this country the bees deposit the honey at the foot of the mounds around the bushes. He was taken on board by the Captain Major 
and being placed at the table, he ate where we ate. On the following day, the captain major had him well dressed and sent ashore. On the following day, fourteen or fifteen natives came to where our ships lay. The captain major landed and showed them a variety of merchandise, with the view of finding out whether such things were to be found in their country. This merchandise included cinnamon, cloves, seed pearls, gold, and many other things but it was evident that they had no knowledge whatever of such things. They were consequently given little round bells and such things. This happened on Friday, and the like took place on Saturday. On Sunday, about 40 or 50 natives made their appearance, and having dined, we landed, and in exchange for the satils which we came provided with, we obtained shells, which they wore as ornaments in their ears, and which looked as if they had been plated, and foxtails attached to a handle with which they fanned their faces. I also acquired, for one seitel, one of the sheaths which they wore over their members, and this seemed to show that they valued copper very highly. Indeed, they wore small beads of that metal in their ears. On that day, Fernau Solo, who was with the Captain Major, expressed a great desire to be permitted to accompany the natives to their houses, so that he might find out how they lived and what they ate. The Captain Major yielded to his importunities, and allowed him to accompany them. And when we returned to the Captain Major's vessel to sop, he went away with the Negroes. Soon after they had left us, they caught a seal, and when they came to the foot of a hill in a barren place, they roasted it and gave some of it to Fernalville Solo, as also some of the roots which they ate. After this meal they expressed a desire so that he should not accompany them any further, but return to the vessels. When Fernal Veloso came abreast of the vessels he began to shout, the negroes keeping in the bush. We were still at supper, but when his shouts were heard, the captain major rose at once, and so did we others and we entered a sailing boat. The Negroes then began running along the beach, and they came as quickly up with Fernau as we did, and when we endeavored to get him into the boat, they threw their assegas and wounded the Captain Major and three or four others. All this happened because we looked upon these people as men of little spirit, quite incapable of violence, and had therefore landed without first arming ourselves we then returned to the ships. At daybreak of Thursday the 16th of November, having careened our ships and taken in wood, we set sail. At that time we did not know how far we might be abaft the Cape of Good Hope. Pero d'Alenquer thought the distance about 30 leagues, but he was not certain, for on his previous return voyage he had left the Cape in the morning and had gone past this bay with the wind astern, whilst on the outward voyage he had kept at sea and was therefore unable to identify the locality of where we now were. We therefore stood out towards the south-southwest, and late on Saturday we beheld the Cape. On that same day we again stood out to sea, returning to the land in the course of the night. At last on Wednesday, at noon, Having the wind astern, we succeeded in doubling the cape, and then ran along the coast. To the south of this cape of Good Hope, and close to it, a vast bay, six leagues broad at its mouth, enters about six leagues into the land. Late on Saturday, November 25th, the day of St. Catherine's, we entered the bay of Sam Brass, where we remained for thirteen days. For there, we broke up our store ship and transferred her contents to the other vessels. On Friday, while still in the Bay of Sambras, about 90 men, resembling those we had met at St. Helena Bay, made their appearance. Some of them walked along the beach, whilst others remained up on the hills. All, or most of us, were at the time in the Captain Major's vessel. As soon as we saw them, we launched and armed the boats, and started for the land. 
When close to the shore, the Captain Major threw them little round bells, which they picked up. They even ventured to approach us, and took some of the bells from the Captain's hand. This surprised us greatly, for when Bartholomew Diaz was here, the natives fled without taking any of the objects he offered them. Nay, on one occasion, when Diaz was taking in water, close to the beach, they sought to prevent him, and when they pelted him with stones from a hill, he killed one of them with the arrow of a crossbow. It appeared to us they did not fly on this occasion, because they had heard from the people at the Bay of St. Helena, only sixty leagues distant by sea, that there was no harm in us, and that we even gave away things which were our own. The Captain Major did not land at this spot, because there was too much bush, but proceeded to an open part of the beach, when he made signs to the Negroes to approach. This they did. The Captain Major and the other captains then landed, being attended by armed men, some of whom carried crossbows. He then made the Negroes understand, by signs, that they were to disperse and to approach him only singly or in couples. To those who approached he gave small bells and red caps, in return for which they presented him with ivory bracelets such as they wore on their arms, for it appears that elephants are plentiful in this country. We actually found some of their droppings near the watering place where they had gone to drink. On Saturday, about 200 Negroes came, both young and old. They brought with them about a dozen oxen and cows and four or five sheep. As soon as we saw them, we went ashore. They forthwith began to play on four or five flutes, some producing high notes and others low ones, thus making a pretty harmony for Negroes who are not expected to be musicians and they danced in the style of Negroes. The Captain Major then ordered the trumpets to be sounded, and we, in the boats, danced, and the Captain Major did so likewise when he rejoined us. This festivity ended, we landed where we had landed before, and bought a black ox for three bracelets. This ox we dined of on Sunday. We found him very fat and his meat as toothsome as the beef of Portugal. On Sunday, many visitors came, and brought with them their women and little boys, the women remaining on the top of a hill near the sea. They had with them many oxen and cows. Having collected in two spots on the beach, they played and danced as they had done on Saturday. It is the custom of this people for the young men to remain in the bush with their weapons. The older men came to converse with us. They carried a short stick in the hand, attached to which was a fox's tail, with which they fanned the face. Whilst conversing with them, by signs, we observed the young men crouching in the bush, holding their weapons in their hands. The Captain Major then ordered Martin Afonso, who had formerly been in Mancongo, to advance and to buy an ox, for which purpose he was supplied with bracelets. The natives, having accepted the bracelets, took him by the hand, and pointing to the watering place, asked him why we took away their water, and simultaneously drove their cattle into the bush. When the Captain Major observed this, he ordered us to gather together, and called upon Martin Afonso to retreat, for he suspected some treachery. Having drawn together, we proceeded to the place where we had been at first. The Negroes followed us. The Captain Major then ordered us to land, armed with lances, assegas, and strung crossbows, and wearing our breastplates, for he wanted to show that we had the means of doing them an injury, although we had no desire to employ them. When they observed this, they ran away. The Captain Major, anxious that none should be killed by mischance, ordered the boats to draw together. But to prove that we were able, although unwilling to hurt them, 
he ordered two bombards to be fired from the poop of the longboat. They were by that time all seated close to the bush, not far from the beach, but the first discharge caused them to retreat so precipitously that in their flight they dropped the skins with which they were covered, and their weapons. When they were in the bush, two of them turned back to pick up the articles which had been dropped. They then continued their flight to the top of a hill, driving their cattle before them. There is an island in this bay, three bowshots from the land, where there are many seals. Some of these are big as bears, very formidable, with large tusks. These attack man, and no spear, whatever the force with which it is thrown, can wound them. There are others much smaller, and others quite small. And whilst the big ones roar like lions, the little ones cry like goats. One day, when we approached this island for our amusement, we counted, among large and small ones, three thousand, and we fired among them with our bombards from the sea. On the same island there are birds as big as ducks, but they cannot fly, because they have no feathers on their wings. These birds, of whom we killed as many as we chose, are called Fotilikaios, and they bray like asses. Whilst taking in water in this bay of Sambras, on a Wednesday, we erected a cross and a pillar. The cross was made of a mizzen mast and very high. On the following Thursday, when about to set sail, we saw about ten or twelve negroes, who demolished both the cross and the pillar before we had left. Oh, those rambunctious negroes! How perfectly clever of them! And quite naked, too! What a world it was, then! So full of wonder, potential, and dangling bits and pieces. Remember always to keep your home clean of others' religious paraphernalia, friends. You just can't trust that stuff. Now, a tea leaf reading. That's something you can count on. Would you say that looks like an hourglass perched on a skull? I'll read up on it later. Good night. <laughs>